Hey everybody, it's Norm back for yet another edition of Behind the Garage Door. Today, Will and I are headed a little bit west from Plant City to an area called Lake Thanona Sassa to meet up with another guy named Norm who has quite an impressive garage. So we made it out to Norm's beautiful home here near Lake Thanona Sassa and Norm, I gotta tell you that Wow, what a great place. Well, thank you for coming, Norm. Absolutely. I've seen it. That's going to get a little confusing. Yeah, it's the Norman Norm Show. The Norman Norm Show. <laughs> so your collection of vehicles is in an area in your home, which I've seen stuff like this on television before or on the internet, but yeah. I've never actually seen something like this in person. And the cool thing about this episode of Behind the Garage Door is the fact that we're not outside. We're actually going to check out what's behind the garage door from inside. Yeah, we're gonna do it a little different approach this time. So, well, welcome to my home and welcome to my uh, display garage. So Absolutely. We had the fortune of building this home three years ago and you know, I've been in other places before and you always have to have your cars in a warehouse somewhere <laughs> yep. or you have a separate garage. And so when we built this home, I was like, this house needs to have the display garage as part of the home. So please come on And that's exactly out. what it did. Different behind the garage door for sure. Okay, so we've made it down the steps into the garage and as I'm counting, this would be without the lifts, a six car, well, you probably put even more, six car garage, but yeah. you've added two lifts in it. So you actually get eight cars in here. Yeah, or technically right now, seven cars and a trailer. Oh yeah, I see, I guess it is a trailer <laughs> over there. Oh, and three motorcycles, don't forget yep. that. Oh, and the big screen TV and the big matching cabinets, yeah. matching toolboxes, beautiful floor Thank too, you. by the way. The floor looks fantastic as well as, I like your vintage outboard motors that we have over here. And, yeah. And that you're a collector of multiple things that I see here, even some military. Well, I guess I would say, yeah, I agree. Uh, the, the whole thing is I've always, uh, for me, cars are not just about transportation, obviously, obviously. Uh, us being car guys. Mm -hmm. For us, it's art plus, you know, engineering. And so the art of the cars is a huge part for me. And I think the other part, which you'll see p pieces of here, our motorsports history, you know, so that's kind of I see mixed a Sebring in. poster. Over yeah, there. exactly. So Sebring and other great races from around the, the world and th that kind of memorabilia. This is a this is a fantastic display. I wouldn't even call Thank this you. a garage. I mean, I, we have to come up with a different term when it comes to when it comes to places like this for sure. So let's just start with let's just call it row one. Your sure. German experience right here. You got the Porsche, and uh, what's that behind it that so I that's see? That's a right Mercedes here? E63 S. So okay, let's start with. This very, 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 very impressive GT3. Yes, Where, RS. RS, <laughs> RS, don't forget the RS part. Well, how did you acquire this? This is your most recent? Yeah, so this is my most recent acquisition. So this is a 2019 GT3 RS. Okay. It's the Weissick edition. So part of this car, you know, an RS, the whole thing is the weight savings of the car, okay. right? You're gonna have to educate me on that. Yeah, yeah, so, so uh, well, you have, you know, a 911 turbo, then you have a GT3, which is more of a track car, mm -hmm. but still road, legal and capable. And then you have the GT3 RS, which is the most track focused vehicle that's still street legal. Okay. And really the thing is, is extra components that weigh less. So you're paying more for less I. weight. The carbon. Yeah. So for example, this car, the Weissick package, you got a carbon fiber hood, a carbon fiber roof, and the carbon fiber rear tail. And Mirrors. And mirrors. Well, the mirrors is actually a little extra addition in okay. addition to the Weissick package. But the Weissick package, when it came from the factory, was a $14,000 option. And so the story goes that they sold too many of them, or they were selling them too quickly. They didn't expect as many people to elect that option. Okay. And so what was happening was the hood, they couldn't produce enough and maintain the quality control on the finish of the raw carbon, carbon fiber. Right. So you could still get the Weissick package, but instead of it being bare carbon fiber, it was still carbon fiber, but it was painted it was over painted. because they couldn't finish the weave out to do the production gotcha. of the numbers. Gotcha. So when I found this car that had the bare carbon fiber hood, it was one of the few that actually made it out of the factory. Um, from the original orders and builds that came with the bare carbon, fiber, the bare carbon fiber. So I think it's a really unique that's, uh, I mean, that's, feature of this vehicle. That's, I mean, the, the way it flows from the hood to the roof back to the wing. Yeah. It just looks so good. And even the steering wheel. Yeah, so I feel like there's, uh, I feel like there's more of a story to it than that from Porsche though, because now you can go back to the Porsche website and you can order 
a bare carbon fiber hood from them to after market yeah, fit yeah. onto your vehicle, but they charge $23,000 just for the hood. And then you can get the rear tail for 13,000 by itself. And you can't get the roof because the roof has to be manufactured at the time. So to do it after the fact, you're 30 some thousand dollars Completely. in on a 14,000 so dollar option. So my, my th take is that the reality is they weren't charging enough for the package. <laughs> that makes so sense. So that, that's the story on this that car. That makes sense. So you've had this. Yeah, so I've had long. this um, a little less than a year now. And I had another GT3 RS before that. I don't know if you're able to pan up there. So that was a 2011. And that was, you know, the good old, you know, six speed manual. Yeah. And that was, but that was also an RS. Um, and this is just one generation later. But I have to tell you the technological and performance differential between this vehicle and that vehicle is like night and day. Wow. And uh, this does have the PDK transmission in it, so it's a dual clutch. Dual clutch. And you know, you read all the forums and everybody's like, ah, oh, you know, dual clutch is for wussies, you know, you should have a manual. Whatever, and you know, The, the I thing don't... is, you couldn't get this in a manual yeah. at the time. Um, like, you know, a lot of people are saying the same things about the Corvette right now. Right. But, and you know what, I guarantee you they've never driven one. Well, the reality is, uh, it's not, no kidding. And the reality is, like you compared to like the other supercars out there, McLarens, all the Ferraris, all those cars are all dual clutches. Mm -hmm. And so the manual, while engaging and fun to drive, it's infinitely slower. <laughs> it is. And uh, so you can't make a supercar like this and have it coming out of the gates slower than its competition. That's that's a that so, is a, that is a fact. Yeah. Well, this thing looks like it is an absolute blast to. I mean, just to get in and drive around town, let alone get it on track. Have you had it to a track? So I have. Um, so I've taken this to PBIR, and um, I've also taken it to Summer Point, and so I, I've had some fun with it already. Not uh, not as much as I would like to. I right. still plan to do more. Sure. Um, I've done a lot of track stuff over the years, mm -hmm. and my experience with this car on the track is such that. It is so composed and has such good traction and is so confidence inspiring that it allows you to drive faster, quicker. Um, but I also think it gives you many false senses because literally a guy could buy this off the showroom floor and probably take it out to the track and they think- And wreck it real quick. Yeah, and they're just, they think <laughs> they're just able to drive it and it's really not that kind of car, you know? But when you, but this is literally just stuck to the no, ground. No, it really is. And you know, I compare it to the last GT3 RS, that car, what was really fun and engaging about it was it was raw and you felt on the edge and you were, it yeah, was raw yeah. and you were on the edge. Somehow this just covers down on that and it's just so composed. It's almost like you have infinite grip <laughs> and fantastic. infinite capability and the brakes oh, the and tires the too, way that it, it, it handles the turns and accelerates and the, the, the integration of the transmission and the engine is just phenomenal. This is a beautiful, beautiful car, and it Thank has you. to be an absolute blast to drive. Thank you. So we continue our tour of Germany, and we head back to the Mercedes. Yes. Tell us about this one. So it's an E63S, this is a 2014. So this is the newer V8 by turbo, so it's a 5.8 liter twin turbo, twin turbo, but it's also all wheel drive. So <sighs> what's crazy about this car, so like the E63 AMG, I think is, 500, four horsepower or something like that. Then the S model is 517 horsepower. Okay. This is also the Rentec <laughs> package on top of it. So <laughs> it gets an extra ECU upgrade and some other uh -huh. modifications. Yeah. So this is 669 horsepower. Just go to the grocery store. Yeah, yeah, so, <laughs> but you know, so this is like a German muscle car. Yes, so you know, is. like guys love the Challengers and they love the Ford Mustang. And my, my son was a big Ford Mustang fan uh -huh. and driver. Um, and so this is like my version of the American muscle car, but a German muscle car. Yep, yep. Okay, so we move from Germany and we head back across the pond to the United States of America. And I see a beautiful representation, a meticulous representation of a 67 Firebird. Convertible yes, even. exactly. So uh, I guess this is kind of back to where it started for me, except not this car. You know, we all wish we could have our first car still, but can't yes, have that. Uh, but I had a 1975 Pontiac Trans Am. And that was my first car, 1975. I graduated high school in 85, so it was a 10 year old car. But right. that's the car that got me started. And uh, after that, I kind of got into more of the sports and exotics and race cars. Mm -hmm. And so to get back into muscle cars was something I always wanted to add into my collection, sure. if you will. So yeah. this is the first car that came back into the collection as uh, like the starting muscle car for me. Okay. 
And so, you know, I was all, I mean, I, my first car, Trans Am, so huge Pontiac fan, but I always loved the Z28s as well. Mm -hmm. um, but honestly, there was something about the first generation Firebirds and the fact, you know, that Camaro came out with theirs first mm -hmm. and then General Motors was allowed Pontiac to make one, but they had to wait till afterwards and they could only modify certain parts of the car. But I really like the kind of the design and the way that Pontiac well, this, implemented the same car, basically. The, the, the first generation Firebird is very similar to the first generation Camaro, but they're completely different cars, are they not? Well, I mean, Except actually- Except maybe the doors? No, the fenders, the, the front fenders, or the, the fenders are allowed to be, were allowed to be stamped differently and shaped differently, uh -huh. and the front fascia and basically the rear fascia. But essentially the components of the rest of the car are similar in design. Okay. They're not interchangeable, but though design-wise, those were the areas that the Pontiac was able to deviate from what Camaro had come up with. They, right. they were not trying to spend so much money. So. Well, because the hood is completely different. Completely. You know, the, the, you can tell that the, the, the front fender. Well, I mean, are if different. you come up to the front here, you know, so you're bringing up the kind of the design points. So yeah. For me, this was supposed to be European styling and European handling when they first advertised this car. Okay. But if you look at the front nose, obviously it has more of a pointed front nose. Kind of has the iron board indentation. You know or, what? I never you know, noticed that before. Right. It does look like an iron iron Correct. board. And so this is this is a Ram Air, although it's a false Ram Air. It's not okay. open ducting. Mm -hmm. uh, but this is the 400. And so uh, the other thing that was really unique about this vehicle, they're this is the last year of the hood mounted tax. Yes. Or maybe 68 might have been the last year. I know in 69 they were gone. But to find this car, so actually this car was built in May of 1967, it's which is car. the very first month of production for the Firebird. So they found car. a car from May 67 that had these options. Um, the hood tack has the you know, M21 four speed. Is it a real 400 four speed car? Oh, it is. It this is. is a real, this is a numbers matching, okay. rotisserie restored. Although people always say, you know, the, the catch term is like it was a, a previous restoration or a dated restoration, but it, it had been done at mm -hmm. some point on this car. The other thing has fully electric roof. Okay. And this, believe it or not, is a pretty rare option. It has the oh, folding, folding, rear seat. folding down rear seat wow. for uh, luggage and or the dogs. And it also had the um, safety glass, the safety soft glass. I forget exactly what that's called. Oh yeah, I know. I know exactly what you're talking about. And the uh, the vents in the doors. Yeah, and I'm gonna vents. I'm gonna pop the hood here for you guys. And so again, this is how this car came from the factory. So Beautiful. it had the chrome, mm -hmm. you know, intake and valve covers. Mm -hmm. Um, so anyway, just an original car. It's not a hundred point car by any means, right. but it's a, it's a driving car, but a, a, just a great car to have found and have in the collection. Well, you can tell that this thing was done, put back exactly the way it was from, from the factory. And it looks, it's, it looks fantastic. So I have to tell you, when I first started looking, um, obviously, you know, you find black cars or red cars. I really didn't like white, mm -hmm. but I never thought that I would buy a Gulf Tur turquoise car. Is it, what, what's the actual name so of the, the color? Golf turquoise. Golf turquoise. And of course, it has the matching turquoise interior. Yep. Now, the the soft top roof is black, not okay, not turquoise. But even back then, the seat belts would have been turquoise. Uh huh. Uh, but you can't buy those reproduction anymore. You can only buy the black ones. Right. Um, but those are the original Body by Fisher ones. I can see the buttons. Yeah. Well, you know exactly. So yeah. it's. Um, it's a well-preserved car and, and pretty close to exactly like it came from the factory. Looks so. fantastic, I love it. And again, you know, as I started looking around, I, like what I realized is like, I could not have found a better example of a 1967 Pontiac Farber than Gulf Turquoise with Turquoise interior, because if you actually look at their literature, that's an actual ad. <laughs> this is basically, is that? that's what they were using to, to showcase around the country when the new car came out. That's the car. All right, so we move from one 400 four-speed Firebird onto another 400 five-speed right. Firebird. And you know, Norm, you, you and I have never met until today, but I know that I've seen this car before. So. Yeah, probably so. I mean, uh, I, I love to do stuff around Lakeland and mm -hmm. we do road rallies and car shows. And uh, we have taken this on autocrosses. I've gone to the Porsche Club autocross in this car before. How to do? Uh, well, it's, uh, <laughs> it's kind of <laughs> like that car. You know, you can have lots of power, you can redo all the suspension, but you can't 
modernize a yeah. car and make it do like that. But you know what? I probably had more fun than anybody out there. Absolutely. And uh, a lot of people were watching me for sure. Hundred <laughs> percent. There it goes. And I made again. the most amount of sound too. As I could tell What's you. What's under that. the hood of this one? All right. So this is my 1970 Firebird Formula 400. It did start out as a four-speed. So very similar to that car, except that that car was numbers matching 67. I found this 70. I've always loved the Formula with the Ram Air mm -hmm. and the, the snorkels. snorkel. So yeah. I found this car in New York and sent it down and then started doing more research on it. And it was an, it's basically in the condition that you find it now. I mean, except for the mods that I've done. Mm -hmm. um, a really good starting car, starter car. The number on the engine did not match though. So it was the right block, but not a numbers matching. Right, right. So actually for me, that was probably the best thing. <laughs> Because this car I can have fun with. <laughs> yes, so yes. That's what I've done. And so just to kind of talk you through. Yeah. First off, and then you can't really see from here, but we did Hotchkiss Stage 2 sport suspension all the way around. Okay. So all new leaf springs, upper, lower control arms, and a sway bar. I mean, all suspension completely replaced. And lowered. And quite lowered. A bit. Um, exactly. Then we did these 18 inch wheels. I, I was trying to keep the car look authentic and to the period, you know, correct yeah. for 1970s or muscle cars. Yep. So I did 18 inch wheels, put Willwood uh, six piston disc brakes all the way around. That'll stop on a dime. Yeah, and then under the hood, so the fun didn't start there, or didn't stop there. <laughs> Don't hit that, good Lord. So. The, okay, you got me, I was expecting an LS. Yeah, so that's what I that's what I did not want to do. You know? yeah, I was it's like everybody LS. does like LS swaps. Yep. And so uh, pro touring, but I wanted to stay old school and authentic. Okay. So it's the same 400 block I took that I bought the car with. Okay. But board 30 over. So it's a 461 stroker motor. Gotcha, now. gotcha. And uh, all of the package came from Butler Performance, which oh, are the big Pontiac guys. They are the, they are the Pontiac yep, guys. Yep, so I, they, I didn't send the engine to them. I bought the components from them and we built the engine ourselves. Okay. But basically, you know, yeah, so we have the Edelbrock heads, Edelbrock electronic fuel injection. We added a Tremec 5 speed. And I also added air conditioning, yeah, which is actually very important. Absolutely. Vintage air, I added that. Um, we also did the Hydro Boost. Um, brake system, brake system. Yeah, exactly, which made yep. a huge difference because you just didn't have the vacuum in the car mm -mm. to provide the stopping power. Mm -mm. But you know, as you can see, and the the original manifold that came from the package with the package was much higher. Yeah, it does. But, you know, I had to find a flatter plane manifold because I wanted to use the original Ram Air intake yeah. still hooked up so to the snorkel. So it's functional. It is functional. It is functional, and it sounds great. And you know, I, again, I want to open the hood, and I want it to be like that's what I remember back in high school. You know, you that's, got, that's, I mean, I'm I'm impressed, and and I I think you know, pat on the back yeah. for it not being an LS. Well, you see a lot of it. It makes a lot of sense. I mean, they're efficient. They're efficient. They're, they make a ton of power. Yeah, they're they cheap. Exactly. I mean, you spent probably on that engine what most guys with an LS swap would spend on a whole car. Probably. I mean, you, you, it, this costs more money to do <laughs> yes, this. You know, but... a lot. So, and it being a Pontiac, if you, if you did a big block Chevy, it would right. have been cheaper, you know? Right. So we end up back in the front of row two again to go up top to this, I'm, well, it's a bright red race car. <laughs> Tell yeah, me so, about that, Norm. All right, so this is a uh, 2006 Radical SR3. So they're built in the UK. They're hand built in the UK. Obviously, they're track cars only. They're not mm -hmm. street legal. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's a fair number of these in the States. I mean, uh, and they've continued to manufacture them, you know, so there, there are newer versions of them now also. It's, called, it's Radical? Yeah, Radical. So I, okay, so I knew that they made, I, I have seen other Radicals on the street before. Are there street versions no, of that? No, I think you're seeing the Aerial Atom. Maybe that's what it is. I thought Aerial so. Atom was a similar kind of car, but okay. it has more of an exposed um, body. It's a tube construction okay. also. But so yeah, you wouldn't no, see a Radical no, on the street? No, no, you wouldn't see a Radical on okay, the street. Okay, back no, to no. this then. But in any event, I, I, I've done a fair amount of like amateur racing over the years. And mm -hmm. so this was my car for me. And so before I was using this car, before I got this car, I was using Porsche 911 turbos on the track. Okay. And was having a lot of fun and a lot of success with them. But what you realize is you can only go so far and so fast in a street car that you're trying to make a track car. You ultimately have to have a track car yep. if you want to, if, if you, you want a race car, right? That's right, yep. And so, uh, I decided on this car, and you know, I also have uh, 
a lot of background, at, like I said, in Porsche and in Ferrari. And so I looked at the Ferrari Challenge cars and I looked at the GT3 Cup cars. And honestly, this car was faster and less expensive to operate and less expensive to acquire. Okay. So, um, but ultimately this car, for example, only weighs 1200 pounds. Oh my God. And so it's 250 horsepower and it doesn't, you're like, well, 250 horsepower doesn't sound like much. But only 1200 pounds. pounds. I mean, so the power to weight ratio is like Jeremy Clarkson would say is greater than a Ferrari Enzo. Okay. And not only do you have the power, but obviously, I mean, obviously it's only a couple inches off the ground. Yeah. You have the suspension that's adjustable. You have racing slicks, you have the aerodynamics. So this thing is literally, and I hate to use the term like go-kart on rails, but oh, yeah. it's like a go-kart rocket on rails. And honestly, this would drive laps around any of my previous Porsche 911s and or Ferraris oh, on the track. Well, it's a, it's a purpose-built purpose built Yeah, it start, really right? is. And then the other thing, uh, you know, I, I got into this car because with this car, I could kind of see the next level of racing. So not just a guy packing up his own stuff and going to a trailer and going to the track, but you could go there and you could get track support and actually have like a racing team uh -huh. and then participate in actual races, which I did a lot at Sebring. There's a couple groups, people probably know about Chin Motorsports. Mm -hmm. They're more driver's education, not necessarily racing, but there was another group, PBOC um, Motorsports, that actually were more of a racers group that also had driver's education. So it, it gave me an opportunity to experience a different level of racing and track experience and you could with like a regular car prepared for the track. Well, this would be the next level up from racing your 911s or whatever. Yeah. And probably fairly affordable to do too. Yeah, and it's still expensive. <laughs> but as a privateer. <laughs> but, but no, it is, exactly. And that's the thing. It allowed me to get into that tier of racing with a car that was very capable. Yeah. So, so how often do you go racing? Well, I, I have to tell you, and it, it's almost like the rest of these cars with a year and a half basically of COVID right now, things have really gotten out of sink you yeah, know yeah so I, I had this out it's been about a year this thing gets a lot of attention and i know that will's will's girlfriend loves these right. things as well a land rover defender yes yeah, so i gotta tell you these things actually have a huge cult following and, and i never really had the idea of what it was until i got one um bottom line is you know i again i keep saying different things for mm -hmm. different needs mm -hmm. and so and I've had a couple like Cayennes and stuff like that but I've never had like an off-roading or you know true utility vehicle and what got me started thinking about them was going to car shows and seeing like the early 70s Toyota Land Rovers land yeah, yeah they have the Land Cruisers yeah. exactly and that that's what was really catching my attention and so I started researching and looking and seeing what was available and what the prices were and the more I kept looking I kept bumping into Land Rover Defenders and I was like now that looks pretty cool. <laughs> and not only that, I was like, why is the price so high? You know, it's amazing the value that these things have retained. And they just, they're, they're just have such a cult following that- There's a demand for them. Oh, there really is a demand for them. So believe it or not, I found this one in South Tampa and I was at an appointment. And so I, I've had this vehicle for about four years now. And uh, I was leaving my appointment, pulling out of the parking lot and there was a small little consignment auto dealer across oh, okay. the street and this was sitting out front and I was like you got to be kidding me I was like here's a Land Rover Defender just like what I've been looking for right here in South Tampa you know yeah. so I went and took a look at it and uh, I called my son and so he came and joined me and we went and looked at the vehicle and I was like well let's take this for a test drive so we went out for a test drive and as we were test driving literally we had two different cars two different people like flag us down and chase us down and had us roll down the window and they're like, man, we love your vehicle. You know, and I was like, oh, I'm crazy? just test driving. I just found it. And then uh, our joke ever since then has been that those guys actually worked for the dealer and then they just follow you <laughs> off the lot. <laughs> Let's not forget that. We're going to start doing that. So anyway, this is the vehicle. So this is a 1988 Land Rover Defender. Really? So this is a true left-hand drive vehicle okay. defender from Italy. From Italy. Yep, exactly. So this is when I was talking about my Rosa cars, and I don't have the other Italian here right now, but right. it was Germans, Americans, then Italians. So even yeah. though this was a British vehicle, this is actually an Italian. An Italian. Exactly, a, imported vehicle from 1988. I, could, I, thought, I thought that this thing was newer than that. I didn't realize this yeah, was Yeah, so um, same thing, kind of like these cars, I found them from somebody that's already done a fair amount of yeah. restoration work. And, yeah. and you know they've modded them out a little bit to mm -hmm. make them more modernized. But essentially the car is exactly like it came from the factory. 
It had the original 2.5 liter turbo diesel in it. Okay. And there literally is more oil comes out of the engine than stays in the <laughs> engines. You know, I would come back from a drive and literally- So you had, check the gas you know, and fill it, the oil? Well, and part of it is so it had no method of recirculating the oil, believe it or not. So it would come out through the breather oh. and get in the part where the canister would fill up so much and then it would just start dripping out of the canister. Yes. That was a flaw in the design. Yeah. So the later model, starting in 89, there was a 200 TDI motor, which is part of my segue here. Mm -hmm. So what we've done with this vehicle is we've completely modernized it to the new 200 TDI motor. Okay. So same basic motor, but then they- Still diesel? They, still diesel, okay. turbo diesel. And so they, they fixed the recirculation problem, and it actually goes back into the crankcase. As it should. And then they added an intercooler. Oh. But so the original motor, believe it or not, had 86 horsepower. And that's 86 horsepower back in 1988. <laughs> so it was probably like 67 horsepower, uh -huh. who knows, that I was driving around with. And this yeah. vehicle is probably 3,500 pounds not light, or not so. Light. No, it's a it, big cube. Yep. Yeah. And uh, so the newer motor is 30% more power and just a more efficient modern version of the previous motor. What I wanted to do, same thing. You find guys that are swapping LS motors in these uh -huh. with eight speed automatic transmissions. I didn't want that. <laughs> I wanted the raw. Yeah. Same diesel experience. And so by doing the 200 TDI, it allowed me to modernize it, make it more drivable on yeah. the current roads, and uh, but still keep the, you know, the original character of the car. So do you use this to pull that? Yeah, so I just got that uh, this past year. But so this grew out of the motorcycle camping. When I figured out I couldn't <laughs> stay more than one night or have more food, yeah. I bought this. So this is a small little teardrop trailer. Yeah, those are beautiful. So it's just small enough that I can pull it with this trailer and go camping and you know have a good time with yeah, it. Yeah, so. yeah, yeah. Well, Norm, thank you so much for thank allowing you. us to come to your beautiful home and uh, showing us the Porsche and the Mercedes and both the Firebirds, the race car, the, 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 the Land Rover Defender, the motorcycles. Norm's done a hell of a job making a hell of a collection here, and he's got some really, really neat stuff. Thank you so much for being on uh, this episode of Behind the Garage. Oh, thank you. It was a pleasure. All right. All right. We're back from Lake Sonoma, Sassa, and Norm's garage. Can you believe that place? Oh, wow. Beautiful. It's really cool when you have your man cave and you also have a big glass wall that you can look out over, you know, all of your cool cars. Porsche GT3 RS, couple of Mercedes, the uh, Land Rover Defender, uh, his radical race car and two beautiful Firebirds, couple of motorcycles sprinkled in just for good measure. Thanks Norm for inviting us out to your house and sharing with us what's behind your garage door. Make sure you uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel throw a few comments down below and make sure you tune in every Thursday for another episode of Behind the Garage Door. Stingray Chevrolet, relax, enjoy the day.